Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Pharmacy Alumni Association and the School of Pharmacy's annual Don B. Catterman Memorial Lecture, part two. We had part one last week, and this is part two. I am particularly excited about tonight's lecture with Dr. Ahmed Ali. Uh, given his work with the Somali and the broader immigrant communities in the Seattle area, I think you'll come to appreciate that he is an incredibly inspiring pharmacist. I'm very excited um, for you all to hear his lecture. But before we begin, I would like to address a topic that again has found its way into the public conscience. And that's a topic of racism. The murders of eight people in Atlanta yesterday, including at least six women of Asian descent are all the more horrific in the context of the rise of anti-Asian violence, harassment, and bigotry that we have seen around the country, including here in Seattle. Our hearts are with those who have lost loved ones, as well as the, as the survivors of these attacks. And they are with all those who have been touched by this heinous crime and by the other acts of violence and hate directed at Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander communities. As we know, this form of bigotry is not new. It has a long and shameful history in our nation. And we must recognize this anti-Asian hate for what it is and stand together to condemn it. We must commit ourselves as a society to eradicating the racism that inspires such terrible violence. If you witness or are aware of racist incidents, please speak up, please report them. Please also make sure to take the time you need for self-care. And I ask our entire pharmacy community to care for and support our Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander colleagues, friends and neighbors. Now, I'd like to begin tonight's event on a very positive note. As you may know, Governor Inslee last week announced plans to move the state to Healthy Washington Phase 3 and that the state's vaccination eligibility will be a week earlier than expected. This is all great news and it bodes well for our plan to be on campus together beginning of fall quarter. Though the broader UW community has endured many challenges these past uh, 12 months, one area we have not wavered on is our strong commitment to science, population health, and service to our local and regional communities. And this includes continuing our public lecture series like the Cattleman Memorial Lecture this evening. In spite of being virtual today, I'm really happy to see all of you that have joined. We have alumni, faculty, friends, and family, and some students who are joining us as well. And by the way, the audience this evening includes some of our newly admitted students who will be starting next fall. We're really very happy that they're able to join us this evening and we look forward to seeing all of you in person this fall. Well, each year we gather at this event to share insights, to learn from leaders in our field and to celebrate our collective impact on pharmacy science, practice and advocacy. This is made possible thanks to the generosity of the Catterman family who continue to provide support for this lecture in honor of the late Don Catterman. Don graduated from our school in 1948 and was a longtime Seattle pharmacist, a mentor to many students, UW and others, and a former Pharmacy Alumni Association president. He helped shape the practice of pharmacy and the instruction of pharmacy students in our state and it is in his honor that we gather this event each and every year. I would now like to invite Adam Brothers, who is one of our Pharmacy Alumni Association board members and longtime chair of the Catterman Lecture Committee to introduce this evening's program and speaker. Adam, over to you. All right, thank you, Dean Sullivan, and thank you all for joining us again this evening for night two of this great Pharmacy Alumni Association tradition. My name is Adam Brothers, and I'd once again like to thank the other members of the Catterman Lecture Committee 
as well as the other members of the PAA board for their assistance in planning this year's event. I'd also like to thank the School of Pharmacy's advancement team for all their help in making events like this evening's lecture possible. For the pharmacists participating in tonight's lecture, you have the option of receiving 30 minutes of Washington State continuing education credit for this evening's presentation. If you've previously signed up to receive CE credit while registering for this event, please take a moment to check that your Zoom participant name aligns with the name you use during your registration. Our Zoom participant report will replace our usual check-in sheet and we want to make sure you're recorded as attending this lecture. If your name does not match, you can follow the instruction shown here on the screen and click on the link that has been dropped into the chat for additional instructions. If you select the CE options during your registration and your name can be found on the participant report for this evening, then an activity evaluation survey will be emailed to you in the next day or two. If you did not sign up for CE credit, but would like to receive it, please email rxevents, that's r-x-e-v-e-n-t-s at uw.edu. If you're currently a PAA member, or if you become a PAA member this evening, you'll receive free CE credit. Otherwise, you can purchase CE credit for $15. We appreciate all of our PAA members as together you make events like this evening possible. Now, for this evening's lecture, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Ahmed Ali as our speaker. Ahmed is the owner of the Othello Station Pharmacy and serves as the executive director of the Somali Health Board, which serves the greater Somali community here in King County. If you've not had the chance, I invite you to take some time to visit the Somali Health Board website and to view the Seattle Times story and video about the pop-up COVID vaccination efforts that Dr. Ali is helping to lead. Tonight, we will hear from for him about serving immigrants and refugees. There are many reasons for gaps in health outcomes for members of immigrant and refugee communities. Dr. Ali will lead us through his experience and the experience of the Somali Health Board in reaching out to reduce health disparities and striving to ensure a thriving and healthy Somali community in Washington State. Finally, we have a few logistical pieces for this evening. Please remember to stay muted during the presentation and please use the Zoom chat to enter questions and comments throughout the lecture. Our moderator will then surface these questions to Dr. Ali at the conclusion of the presentation. And many thanks to Don Downing for helping us to moderate the Q&A session this evening. Just like last week's lecture, we will have the opportunity to continue the conversation on improving health outreach to immigrant and refugee communities after the Q&A session. But now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ahmed Ali. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, I will start my presentation. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Looks good. Good, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Ahmed Ali, uh, and I am a pharmacist by profession and a public health advocate. I really want to take this opportunity to thank uh, University of Washington School of Pharmacy, um, and in particular, uh, Maddie and her team, uh, and the WSPA, and Jenny Arnold for this invitation. I am honored uh, to share this uh, afternoon with uh, colleagues, pharmacists, and students and be able to share my experiences uh, in the pharmacy field and what we have done through Somali Health Board and as a pharmacist as well. Before we start uh, the, this evening's lecture, I want to follow up with uh, what uh, Dean Sullivan has mentioned early on about the statement in regards to racism and just throw in a, a, an acknowledgement in there. Uh, and this is something I've accustomed myself to over the years to be able to respond and be able to understand as a refugee myself, uh, some of the uh, historical contexts uh, associated uh, with, the, with this country. And therefore we wanna acknowledge the people's past, present and future of the Duwamish tribe, Makushut tribe and other Coast Salish peoples whose traditional and ceded lands and waters we live in and work today. And more importantly also, we also wanna acknowledge that this country will not exist without the free and slave labor of black people. We honor the knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. Uh, following that, uh, I want to talk just briefly about myself, uh, for those of you who haven't got a chance um, uh, to hear early on. Uh, my name is Ahmed Ali, and I'm the director for Somali Health Board. I came here as a refugee in 1998 uh, here in the United States, particularly in Seattle, where my family relocated from East Africa in Somalia. Uh, and 
due to civil war. I came here at 17 years old uh, and uh, attended Washington University um, for my undergraduate and my graduate program uh, through the pharmacy school there. Uh, interesting enough, I'm, I'm excited that I'm sharing this platform today with uh, the Huskies. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to uh, share uh, my experiences and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, be on your platform. So what are the, some of the learning objectives we uh, hopefully we can cover this, this afternoon? Uh, defining and discussing common misconceptions about refugee, immigrant population, and the medical field. Also recognizing potential barriers that exist for underserved and underrepresented population within your practice uh, whether it is you are at the hospital, the clinics, at the pharmacy settings, and others, in order to uh, uh, that, that oftentimes promote health disparities, and then identifying cultural appropriate opportunities that we can collectively discuss that promote better understanding of the health system, uh, and then identify areas of opportunity to serve your community and advocate for better support and care for your patients. I'm hoping that by the time we, we conclude this uh, presentation, that you understand and know the, some of the challenges that the communities, I mean, immigrant refugees particularly uh, face and what, are the, what is the definition for a community? Because oftentimes there are multiple definitions. It depends on who you're asking. And then I wanna spend a good number of my time to talk about uh, Somali Health Board. And this is a nonprofit organization that I co-founded uh, right after graduating from pharmacy school 2008. Uh, after realizing and recognizing uh, that as a pharmacist, my passion is particularly uh, with uh, the pharmacy field, but at the same time, understanding that I could have an impact in the uh, population health as well. And then a little bit about the Othello Station Pharmacy and its role in the community pharmacy as well. And more so, I uh, also talk a little about in the pandemic, what have we done uh, in promoting uh, testing sites uh, equity, particularly in, in, in terms of accessibility, and then the vaccination distribution process as well. As it had been, been mentioned early on, please drop in your questions in the chat, and we'll be more than happy to answer in during the Q&A session after the presentation. So who is a, what is a community? Uh, I think the definition oftentimes uh, comes in multiple forms. But for me, the way I define community is multi-faceted, uh, and that includes affected individuals, patients who are coming to your pharmacy or the clinics, the hospital. The grass organizations oftentimes are considered a community as well, uh, such as the Somali Health Board, that represents and works with the individuals who are impacted by health disparities, as well as the leadership of the grass organizations, trusted ambassadors, people who actually are involved with those uh, individual uh, patients or folks that you are, you are connected with through the different um, uh, areas in, in, the, in the larger health systems that represent the affected individuals or even large nonprofits or NGOs that work to support the affected individuals. So a lot of times I do get this question that what can we do and what are the, some of the challenges uh, that come along with uh, working with communities, particularly communities of color, immigrant refugee. One of the things I often point out is that it takes time and it, to build and maintain relationships and trust. And just like anything else, uh, it takes time to build that trusting relationship because you have to recognize and understand that for immigrant refugee communities, the health system that we, we practice here in the United States is significantly different than the one they're accustomed to. Uh, and I can speak a lot more about uh, the East African community and the Somali particularly in, in, in this case. And it also takes time to work uh, and, and, and build humility and maintain relationships and trust, as I mentioned. Oftentimes we are uh, the, the, the large system uh, that, uh, that the communities, uh, uh, that, that serves the community oftentimes, uh, doesn't build enough trust and relationship and therefore expects to be able to, uh, for the community to reciprocate uh, in, in terms of receiving services. And then understanding that community priorities differ. Uh, sometimes there is a top-down attitude that I've noticed over the years, and we've managed to have that conversation in multiple uh, areas, whether it's through public health, Department of Health, and other, other spaces, that the, the notion that the larger system knows what the issues that the communities are facing in order to address them is not something that oftentimes can be resolved uh, easily. 
and understanding that some of the priorities that the community has might differ from what the, the, the large system wants to uh, be involved in. And then understand the cultural norms may differ because how healthcare is defined uh, or delivered, as I mentioned early on, is, is significantly different uh, for some community members within uh, the Seattle area and others as well. And also understanding that it takes initiative and drive to seek and collaborate with the community. Uh, intentions matter. Uh, you know, actions and how you collaborate with the community is significant in most cases in order to build that long lasting relationship. So what can you do to foster this relationship? And, you know, I build this uh, few slides based on the experience I've had in the last uh, eight years working with the community and wearing both hats as a, a pharmacist, uh, as a healthcare practitioner and a community member that actually works in the community. So as a practitioner, I think building long-term uh, partnership uh, with the community is significant. Be guided by community priorities, as I had mentioned early on. A good example I can give is uh, a few years ago, we had uh, a researcher that approached the community and that was about four years ago, uh, approached the community and said they want to work on a significant uh, uh, federal uh, research uh, that at that time had a decent amount of funding. And this was about female genital mutilation. Uh, and wanted to have that research conducted so they can pass policies again uh, in regards to that uh, particular issue. You know, we, we reflected on that. We had that conversation because that wasn't a top priority for the community at that time. We're dealing with diabetes. We're dealing with folks who are concerned about high, high, high cholesterol, hypertension, uh, childbirth, youth, uh, mental health, and other things. And we put those together. We realized that actually at this point, regardless of what type of funding is available out there. I don't think it's the appropriate time or the venue at this point, or even the interest of the community to be able to uh, address with this issue because that wasn't uh, the most important thing at that point that the community needed to uh, work on. And also self-reflecting, talking and mentorship. I'm gonna emphasize on that men mentorship later on and talk in depth about the mentorship aspect because I believe that in order for us to address the disparities that communities of color face, I think we need to start developing young health professionals, uh, young students to go into the pharmacy programs, uh, mentorship, uh, mentor them to be able to have, or give them the access at least for them to uh, pursue certain fields that they don't have access to. And I'll talk about that when I talk about Othello Station Pharmacy. And then the practice humility, accountability, and be flexible and resilient. Sometimes your schedule might not work that well with what the community is dealing with at that point. There are so many other barriers that they're facing and, and I'll deal with that, we'll talk about later on. So as the community, in, in, in a flip side to that, uh, as the community oftentimes we, uh, and I talk as myself as we, because in the sense, you know, I worked for Somali Health Board and as defined early on, the community definition can also be leaders within the, 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 the community-based organizations, uh, should be able to be able to recruit youth who are interested in health professionals. Um, I emphasize on the mentorship and be able to recruit and guide young professional, young students to pursue the health field. Uh, throughout my last five, uh, eight years, I've managed to uh, mentor and put five students through uh, different pharmacy schools, including the University of Washington. And I've also managed to mentor uh, and work with three international medical graduates uh, uh, who have graduated, their, their, got their degrees overseas, but needed the 1500 hours or X number of hours uh, hands-on experience so they can sit for the board's exam and be able to uh, uh, practice that on. And also learn to work with the largest systems, institutions. Uh, this is something I've had multiple conversations with the communities to be able to welcome the, the, the large systems and the pharmacies and the clinics that serve them and correct it in the process of reflecting a symbiotic relationship. So this is not just the community getting uh, the services that they need or even research being conducted and their, their, their researchers are gone after the research, but at the same time, build that symbiotic relationship that it goes both way and build that trust as I mentioned earlier. on. And also for the community to leverage their the, the needs and advocate and participate in set priorities, not what the institutions drive. And this is something honestly that is very much significant. A lot of what we see, um, particularly with the research, and I'll talk about later on in community-based participatory research that we participate in, 
and I've been part of is always see large institutions, particularly uh, research institutions coming onto the community, getting data, collecting that data, and then gone. And not being able to find out what, what came out of that data. How is that data, uh, information going to be implied in terms of the community's uh, health? So now I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about a Somali Health Board uh, and why I got involved and what led into, uh, for me to, uh, be able to do what I am doing right now, wearing the hat as a pharmacist. And I can honestly say that this is one of the most rewarding things I've done as a pharmacist. And I really want my colleagues who are part of this, uh, uh, the Ketterman lecture this evening and the previous lecture a week ago, to be able to understand as a pharmacist, you really have a lot of knowledge and, and, and skills that you can uh, share with the community, be able to do more than what, you, what you're currently are doing. Uh, when I graduated from, from uh, WSU in 2008, uh, I decided that I am not just going to be able just to fill prescriptions, get to my patients one-on-one, -on -one, but I also wanted to have a larger impact, as I mentioned early on. Uh, with that, you know, worked with Seattle King County Public Health to identify what are the, some of the challenges. And I worked along with a few other small health professionals because the organization itself consists of health professionals. That was the lens that we were using. How do we encourage young professionals and currently even practicing uh, health professionals to give back to the community? So we set up a, a small uh, focus group session, identified some of the communication challenges that were reaching the Somali community. Uh, because for, so, for some of you who um, live in the Seattle Pacific Northwest, uh, in 2006, there was a severe windstorm. Um, and this was a wake up call for, for Somali health professionals at that time whereby we had a family of six who did not get the King County Public Health uh, information about uh, should the power go out or lose power during the winter storm, not to use uh, their, their, their stoves to warm themselves uh, because, of, because of lack of power. Uh, unfortunately, because of not being translated that information into English or even sharing that information in language that they, they understood, uh, we lost a family of four uh, that was tragic uh, for the community. Following up to that conversation, having sat down with public health, we decided let's translate some of those materials next time, uh, whatever you're sending to the community. And uh, move uh, forward four year, three years later, H1N1 swine flu uh, pandemic was happening uh, and King County did their best, translated the entire uh, pamphlets that were going out to the communities. Uh, and translated swine flu verbatim as it is in Somali uh, into pig flu. Uh, and so for, so for those of you, uh, as I I'd mentioned earlier, on Somalia is in East Africa, the predominant Muslim community, uh, most of them, and almost all of them don't consume pork, decided that they're not gonna be vaccinated because there are assumptions that the vaccine itself is made out of, or even has ingredients that contain uh, pork or pork gelatin. And with, empowered with this, the research we did on, on the uh, focus group sessions, we found out some of the, uh, the key findings that came out of that in included economic barriers, uh, majority of the folks who came in as refugees or immigrants, uh, low income, uh, lack of health insurance, this is pre-affordable uh, care act days, cultural barriers, there was no, they were focused on prevention care, uh, most of the folks and particularly very much so in immigrant refugees, Healthcare is, is oftentimes received as one needs it. So, you know, there's no screenings for cholesterol. There's no screenings for diabetes. You know, folks go to the clinic and their doctors, majority of the places where they came from, only when they're sick. So you're sick, you go to the doctor, you get medicine, you get antibiotics, you get pain medications, and you're done, you're set. You don't see your doctor again until you get sick again. But we wanted to change the narrative. We wanted to change that thought process. There was also concerns about porcine, about vaccinations in general. And I'll talk about later on how we actually managed to change that uh, thought process in terms of gelatin concerns and the pork uh, uh, or porcine uh, ingredients in some of the vaccine products as well. And also stigma on some certain health conditions such as mental health, behavioral health, cancer and vaccinations. There were a lot of misinformation uh, about mental health. How do you define mental health? Because in certain cultures, there is certain 
words don't even exist. Depressions, anxiety, uh, are words that are foreign to our sanic center. Either someone is considered sane or insane. You are either going to be admitted in a medical institution or you're not. There's nothing in between that. So it took a lot of work for us to uh, figure those things out. And then many see the potential value of having healthcare providers. Some of the findings included that they, from, from the community that we gathered, that it is important that they should, we should have healthcare advisory board that comprised or consisted of Somali elders or healthcare professionals. It's also important to include people who are actually able to outreach and what, what I consider are called uh, trusted messengers uh, for the target population uh, uh, would be willing to maintain a relationship with public health because before the Somali Health Board, there was a sing not a single in individual that spoke Somali language that was actually working uh, for public health King County. Uh, clinics such as Swedish uh, had a very limited one or two nurses that were working there or health professionals let alone the small clinics, uh, the, the federal qualified clinics as well. Well, this is one of my favorite quote uh, in 2008 when we talked to some of the community members, uh, we had translated this from Somali, someone that said, people trust rumors. If they hear the vaccine has gelatin, they won't touch it. Or if they hear about the shot, will energize them, then they will believe it. El false information spreads way faster than the truth in our community. And this still, actually still holds truth up to today. We spent a lot of time uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic of the, uh, last year talking to folks about the, the, the COVID itself, the symptoms and signs, where to get back, where to get COVID tested. And then as the vaccine were being developed, we spent a lot of time looking back in terms of what, what we learned previously, um, you know, sharing some of the misinformations about the, the COVID vaccine. And I'll talk about it later on. So from the focus group sessions, what we came up with is an organization called Somali Health Board uh, that consisted primarily of health professionals uh, and uh, started our work uh, in 2012 uh, from initial conversations and actually having meetings. Our very first meeting took place in July 2012. And at these tables, we, we were accustomed to inviting public health, uh, health professionals, the health systems, the large hospitals that serve immigrant refugee populations and the Somali health professionals as well and the community. Uh, we started to specifically uh, targeting specific conversations on prenatal care, labor and delivery because there were some concerns with some of the large hospitals, uh, mothers talking and saying that, you know, the clinics, whenever they go to, they're being pushed into uh, C-sections. Um, and we were very much concerned as, as, uh, as what I will consider the trusted health professionals within the community that for a mother who actually deserves or needs to get a C-section, we don't want her not going to the hospital because they, they feel that everyone is being rushed to get C-section. So we had a focus group session, particularly for the mothers, and decided to have that conversation with some of the clinics, the hospitals that uh, the labor, uh, they were going for their labor and delivery. And I'll talk about that. We, we came up with a very simple program called Somali Centering out of that, that essentially just raised the hand, whole conversation on how uh, delivery method uh, and, and, and understanding of uh, sort of linking how a Somali mother uh, during gestational period uh, would get all type of support. But then when they come here, uh, it's just her and her husband and have a very difficult time of uh, accessing health from that angle. And then subsequent meetings followed up included substance abuse with young kids, with, with teenagers uh, and others as well, mental health, as I mentioned early on, tobacco, uh, because a lot of community members did not understand or could it relate between hooker usage and uh, the nicotine that contains in those uh, devices. And then chronic disease management, cancer and youth. So the Somali Health Board as a model, as I mentioned early on, is the liaison between the health, uh, the health system, uh, the healthcare, and the government system and the Somali community, trying to address the cultural, religious, and historical uh, issues that often comes with access to medicine, and also trying to make sure that we address mistrust, uh, beliefs, and values, addressing values of the Somali community, and while talking to the the health systems. This was our very first uh, quarterly meeting, as I mentioned early on, uh, early 2012. We had public health folks talking about uh, prenatal, postnatal, and, uh, and, 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 and hookah and shisha consumption uh, within the youth. Uh, we had uh, health professionals and the Somali community members 
and on the very far right there, people who are sitting on the table, the three folks are right there in the middle, uh, uh, chairing that uh, meeting. And health for we followed up with what we call annual health fair. Uh, at that time, I used to uh, manage for Walgreens, and we would get vaccines uh, from uh, the pharmacies. And leveraging that conversation with the community, we held our very first uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, screening uh, at, at Al Bakr Islamic Center, which is located in Takula, which is the largest uh, mosque in uh, in the, the Seattle area uh, or the Washington State for Somali community. Deliberately decided to actually hold that event there because we wanted to send a message about the vaccination, about uh, annual influenza vaccine. And the person who I'm vaccinating there is the person who took the first vaccine after having conversation with them is the Imam of the mosque. Um, uh, and that sent a very strong message to the community that if the Imams are able to get the vaccine, then it is fine. There's nothing wrong with, with the, the, the porcine uh, vaccine concerns that they had early on. Interesting enough, as I was putting these slides together, the, the, the young lady on the very back end who's wearing yellow uh, scarf, uh, hijab, uh, is one of our nurses that now helps with the COVID vaccine. She was a student at that time that came to the event uh, that we organized, and, and now she's vaccinated for the, for the COVID. Included this flyer that shows some of the partnership that we build <clears throat> through the organization uh, with some of the health, uh, health systems in order to make sure that the folks understand these are the services that you can get at the Swedish or public health or even some of these uh, small clinics and also to invite the large system to come into the community where they live. Uh, we held this event at New Holy Gathering Hall where there's a sizable number of Somali immigrant and refugee there. Um, and we wanted the health system to actually come to where the communities live so they can understand their own uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, particularly addressing some of the social terms of health. Uh, this is another image of uh, inviting and including every uh, Somali health professional uh, that is whether they are working optician, uh, the eye clinics or the mental health through NAVORS or they work at some of the clinics to come and actually be part of this conversation. And then the health system understands that, well, you know, there are a lot of folks who represent this community and they are not just uh, vulnerable and, you know, there are, they, you can leverage them and have that conversation with them should you need me. So over the last uh, eight years, some of the things we've accomplished, including annual health fairs that often bring more than 40 health professionals, all of them, uh, including uh, non-Somali speaking as well, uh, you know, dealing with initially uh, uh, health screenings that were often considered taboo, such as HIV, mammography, uh, you know, uh, uh, typho typhoid uh, vaccinations and others that oftentimes were not included uh, in other spaces that we, we, we knew uh, the communities were going to. But we wanted to make sure that they feel comfortable. Where they're coming to is a place that they feel comfortable they can relate to. And then we established out of the many programs that we've had and the discussions, we had eight su successful programs that are right now ongoing as an organization that started off as a volunteer-based, uh, now has eight different programs that has uh, 14 full-time employees uh, through the organization and led what I will consider one of my, my proudest moments is to leading uh, community research opportunities through University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson um, and other universities as well with emphasis on always having uh, health professionals or young students um, uh, participate in the research so that they can learn uh, how to navigate that as well and be able to conduct the research down the road. And then, of course, establishing uh, uh, what, what I consider the Community Health Board Coalition, 14 other ethnic health boards that are sort of uh, the same way that uh, the same model the Somali Health Board uh, works on at this point. So going back into uh, the roles that the Somali Health Board played in terms of uh, the community uh, research, uh, particularly community-based participant research, there was one thought process we've used, and, and this is through the uh, School of Public Health uh, global health this is dr kishet running on the right hand on the left hand side of your screen who i contacted with and had this conversation uh, uh about the uh, partnership uh, just recently and and i'll share with you who the students are and and the researchers just so you can get an idea how to ensure that people are involved from the beginning so kishet who i've known for some time called me and said udeb has a put a call for covid health equity grant is someone help with interest in putting something together 
And I say Somali Health Board members are telling us, Somali community members are telling us that they don't have enough access to COVID testing. And Somali Health Board has been advocating for and setting up testing health fairs in South King County. Uh, can we maybe get data to show that uh, the gap that exists um, within uh, the community is particularly the access to COVID uh, testing sites and how can we improve the testing and so forth. So this typically is just a relationship which was built early on uh, between uh, myself and, and Dr. Kishet Ronan over the years. And out of that, we were able to leverage through the School of Public Health to engage uh, this uh, population health equity grant, uh, which was titled Understanding and Addressing Barriers to COVID-19 Testing in Somali Community in South King County, Washington, a community-driven strategy. And if you can see from there, uh, the very top folks are people who uh, either employ the Smart Health Board uh, Dr. Anis Ibrahim is our board president and University of Washington uh, uh, researchers, School of Public Health, uh, Shed Ronan and Kate West. And at the bottom, we have students who are all uh, public health students uh, through University of Washington. And we give them actually an authorship opportunity. All of these students that you see there, Asi Ahmed, Najma Abdi, Sabrina, uh, Nasser Mohammed, Ayan, and Andrea Skeld Skel and all of them are going to be published and be able to publish. They will be the first authors, second authors, uh, of this research that, that will be um, coming out soon. Uh, how did we determine you know, the testing and equities? We knew that uh, you know, through our own efforts through the organization, but we also did a quick research and we looked at uh, cases among King County, Washington race by ethnicity uh, and reference group to uh, you know, thread the red and blue uh, white uh, King County residents compared to the Latin X and the Blacks in accessibilities to, to COVID. And that's how we structured the focus group sessions and the discussions. And you can see that no King County data access testing disintegrated by race, particularly with the Somali community or ethnicity or immigrant and zip status. Right now it's much more, uh, it's a, this is something that we took out of, and I took this uh, PowerPoint, but this is, uh, a year ago, and at the time we were collecting the, the information. Um, but you can imagine the disparities as, as we were uh, looking in terms of how significant it is for accessibility for communities of color. Uh, so we set up two community focus group discussions, and this is essentially how do you scale up that work? Like how do you engage both the students, the community leadership, the people who are impacted, People are taking the, the tests, uh, the, the COVID testings as well. Uh, and some of the group discussions, the COVID vaccine discussions with either our elected officials or the health professionals is that we, we identify awareness of COVID is very low, COVID-19 vaccines is very low. And that gave us a tool that uh, enables us to make sure that we address that should the vaccines come out in 2020 community is divided by supporting the vaccine and needs and more information. There was a lot of distrust about uh, and a lot of concerns uh, that, you know, the vaccines were being tested in Africans uh, by Europeans, gelatin and haram or non-kosher uh, product were in the vaccine. And the vaccine contained chip for codes or causes disease such as autism. Some parents were having that conversations on, on WhatsApp groups and other places. And some plan to wait until what when this is verbatim, how white people were white people were vaccinated before deciding to do so. And with that, we came out and decided, well, with this information, we really need to start having this com communi communications going a lot quicker for us to make sure that, you know, while disparities, uh, the, the COVID disproportionately impacted the Somali community and, and uh, people of color, black and brown folks, we need to make sure that should the vaccines come out, these vaccines are safe, they'll be tested adequately. And as healthcare professionals, we need to make sure that our communities are not left behind in terms of accessibility. So we decided to share, uh, based on the research itself, uh, written video uh, online and WhatsApp groups, uh, short clip videos. I did a very short clip video that is also, you can say, see that on uh, the Seattle Times article, as I was getting vaccine uh, vaccinated at Kelly Ross Pharmacy. Uh, academic dissemination, the peer review publication, uh, also advocating uh, for and report for public health agencies to take action, uh, particularly Department of Health and King County Public Health, and, and, and setting this information all across channels that we can. Uh, with this effort, we were, we've managed to set up uh, nine pop-up clinics to date uh, in the last uh, 28, 30 days. 
and vaccinated over 1,500 people, who most of them are Somali speaking, most of them are Black and African American, and most of them are seniors. Most of them did not have ability to go online and make an appointment. Uh, and, and with that, it, it has given us and the opportunity to be able to share this information as much as we can uh, with, with the community uh, in, in, an, in a way that is easily accessible um, uh, throughout the last three weeks, uh, four weeks uh, that the vaccines or a little bit more, the vaccines have been available for them to walk in into the community and be able to uh, into the pharmacy or the station pharmacy and ask for the vaccines or even call and speak to someone. This has given us an opportunity to at least leverage that disparity or of accessibility that we have seen uh, as the vaccines were rolling out. It's actually one of my proudest moments to see, you know, seniors just walking in, excited to get vaccinated. Some of them who were hesitant initially, and now to see that the nurse that is vaccinating them or the pharmacist who's vaccinated them or the assistant who's at the front of the pharmacy giving the, uh, the vaccines or the pop-up clinics or someone that looks like them that reflects the community that they are part of uh, and for them to get vaccinated and come back. Um, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, pause for questions and, and pass it on to uh, Don and the rest of the team. Uh, to ask questions uh, about the presentation or any other inquiries that you might have. Don, are you? It looks like Don is having a little bit of difficulty with his internet right now, but one of the questions that came up in the chat is, are there additional community health boards that pharmacists should also be aware of as they deliver care, either at the individual or population level? Absolutely, yes. So as I mentioned early on, we have modeled the Somali Health Board uh, uh, the same process and the same thought process of, of uh, engaging health professionals that reflect the communities that they serve. Uh, and I engaged and we've engaged uh, multiple other ethnic communities. To date, we have about 14 other health boards that include the African American Health Board, the uh, Ethiopian, the Eritrean Health Board, the Sham Community Health Board, um, Latinx Health Board, uh, and others as well. So there are other health boards that, uh, that we work with and we collaborate with. Uh, and uh, since a lot of them are, many of them are actually forming at this point uh, and don't have the same capacity as Somali Health Board, uh, we act as a fiscal sponsor and we have a collaboration uh, that we work together uh, through our partnerships. I'm, I'm very much happy to uh, include anyone that needs uh, a specific uh, ethnic health board that I can connect them with as well. Ahmed, this is Don. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear Don. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my internet went down. I'm on my phone. <laughs> um, um, I, I couldn't hear everything, but uh, has the question been asked? Uh, one was in chat about uh, uh, any source of information on gelatin in uh, medications. Do, do you have a source for that? Um, or how can a person make sure there's no gelatin in capsules that they purchase? Or do you take medicine out of capsules and reformulate it? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Very good, Don. A very good question. I think uh, the concern a lot of times, uh, particularly for Muslim, uh, the Muslim population, is how do we ensure that the capsules that you get, you're giving me, uh, does not contain pork uh, or porcine gelatin. Uh, it's a challenge, honestly, and it is something that I, uh, as a pharmacist, oftentimes we've tried to compile certain, at least within the pharmacy itself, uh, but it took a lot of effort, a lot of work um, that oftentimes ca calling the manufacturers and the, the 800 number on the, uh, either in the pamphlet itself and figuring out what type of gelatin is actually encoded with this particular uh, medicine. 
uh, because we've had cases where someone will come back uh, even with a plant-based gelatin if they were not informed at the beginning, they'll come back or they will call and say, well, I don't think I want to take this medication. And the last thing we want is someone not uh, taking the medication, the adher uh, adherence being becoming an issue. Um, so there is no specific uh, tool that is out there, to my knowledge at this point. Uh, but uh, through a fellow station pharmacy, one thing we've done is including prenatal uh, vitamins. Uh, is actually contacting specific manufacturers and then ordering that particular manufacturer for the for the population that we serve. Ahmed, I saw on your uh, website that there is a group of vitamins that are halal, nor vitamins. Do uh, community pharmacies have access to those vitamins? Uh, yes. Uh, any uh, these are uh, manufactured in uh, here in the United States uh, in in New York. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, the company is called Nor Vitamins and OOR Vitamins. Um, and it's one of those things that we initially decided that if we are going to be uh, promoting a certain type of vitamins, uh, while we also carry other mainstream vitamins uh, that we know that uh, don't contain uh, porcine or pork, then at least have something that is uniquely related to the Muslim population. And some of them do order online. They go to Amazon or go directly to the website, um, but it's a lot easier uh, accessibility for the, for the mothers when they come in and they're getting their prescriptions and they just grab that off the shelf. So no vitamins is, is available to any of the uh, pharmacies that need to order that as well. Okay. The, um... I know we're uh, we're running out of time here, and we're we're going to go to um, um, breakout um, here in a moment. And I'm just wondering if uh, this is the time to do that in the name of time. Sure, Don. I think we can go ahead and do that, um, and okay. kind of wrap up the the formal CE uh, portion of the presentation. So, first of all, uh, Dr. Lee, I want to uh, thank you so much for all of your work in the community and for taking the time to share it with us this evening. Um, so as I mentioned, this does conclude the CE portion of the evening. We invite uh, everybody who's interested to stick around uh, and connect with each other through the breakout rooms, um, which will be opening in just a minute. If you join the meeting through a Zoom desktop or through your mobile app, then you should be able to navigate to the room that interests you. You can click on the breakout room icon in your Zoom meeting controls and then select the room you would like to enter by clicking join next to the room title. You can repeat this process to move in between rooms. If you need any assistance with joining a room, simply remain on the screen and our event staff will help you get to the room you wish to join. So as you see, we have uh, two different rooms that will continue the conversation around serving underrepresented populations and then cultural, cultural considerations and navigating the US healthcare system. We also have some spaces uh, just for social interactions if you uh, just wanted to take the time as we so often do at Katerman to catch up with old friends. Uh, thank you all again for joining us online this evening for the last lecture of the 2021 Katerman Memorial Lecture Series. This ends our formal programming, but again, we encourage you all to stay and use this space, in, this space for discussion as long as you would like. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>